Okay, well, welcome to everyone this morning. And uh, that's the way of saying we're getting ready to start. <laughs> I mean, I do welcome you, but you know. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so if you'd like to take your Bibles and turn to uh, Genesis chapter 13 this morning as we get ready to start a class. And, and uh, first of all, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for being who you are and then recording what you did to tell us who you are in the past. And we thank you for that. We pray, Lord, that as we study this, this morning, we might learn more about Jesus. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Genesis chapter 13, beginning verse 6, please. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee. Let me, let, let's start a little bit earlier. I'm sorry, verse, uh, verse 5. And Lot also, which went with Abram, and flo- ha- with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. And the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together. For their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's, Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. Cattle, And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelt then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen. For we be brethren, is not the whole land before thee. Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou wilt depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. Then Lot chose him, all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves, the one from the other. And Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, And Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward, southward, eastward, westward, for all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land and the length of it, or the breadth of it, and I will give it unto thee. Then Abraham removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. Now, We saw in our last study this great problem that had come up between Abraham and Lot. I mean, here, both of them had come out of Egypt very different from how they went into Egypt. When they left Egypt, they both were a lot richer than when they went into Egypt. But the riches turned out to be a real problem because now both Abraham and Lot had so many animals and herdmen to take care of those animals that they both required a very large amount of grazing land for their animals. You know those trails that used to go across the country here, the Co- o- o- Overland Trail they call them? Anyway, different trails. As, they, as, the, as the wagon trains made their way across the land over to, you know, from the, uh, from, they usually start off from St. Joe over to San Francisco, at least that's what they show on the on wagon train, on the team, <laughs> anyway. The, the, um, the, the paths, these trails, kept getting wider and wider until they became like two feet wide, two feet two miles wide they, because of all the grazing of the cattle there and, the, and the animals that had to take place. Okay, so that probably didn't add anything to it, but anyway. <laughs> but this was coupled with the fact that the Canaanites had animals too. And so they weren't real thrilled to see Abraham and Lot with all their animals. And this problem just hit Abraham broadside. He totally did not see this coming. 
We've seen that from Abraham, he had his mind on something else. He came out of Egypt, and he had this singular focus on his mind, this driving passion that he had, and it wasn't his hungry animals as to where they were going to feed. It was more concerned about Abraham's hungry soul and where he was going to feed. And so he was hungry for God, Abraham was. And Abraham had sinned in Egypt, and he had separated, become separated from God, as it says in Isaiah 59, 2. Your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Your sins have hid his face from, from you so that he will not hear. And Abraham was, was longing to get back to the place where the altar was because Abraham was longing to get back to his life with God. And, and, and that's what he was wanting. He wanted to get back in that groove of being centered on God. But this problem of there not being enough grazing land, it just caught Abraham totally off guard. He wasn't expecting it. He didn't see it coming. He just had got his life back together again. And he was walking with God when this happened. And what this shows us is how it, when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, such troubles, they keep coming our way. <laughs> anyway, it shows us that it shows us in 2 Timothy 3.12 Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecutions. It's a, it's a promise. It's a promise. You walk with God, you live godly, you expect problems. Like they say in Japan, every time you go through one problem and you have a victory, they say, tighten your helmet straps, referring to the shoguns. They used to say that, tighten your helmet straps. In other words, get ready for the next one. So, and the Lord said in John 16, 33, these things I have spoken unto you that ye might have peace. In the world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So this was a serious problem that happened because it just drove a wedge right down the middle of Abraham's family, right down the, between Abraham and Lot, right down between the student lot and the mentor Abraham. Tremendous problem that had come up here. And we saw these tragic words in verse 7 where it says, there was a strife. Notice the strife is described in verse 7 as it, it's first between the herdmen of Abraham's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. That's what you see there in verse 7. But the strife grew and it spread. And so when you read in verse 8, Abraham describes the strife not just as between his herdmen and Lot's herdmen, but now it's a strife between me and thee. It's a strife now between Abraham and, and Lot. So it started off as a strife between the herdmen of Abraham and the herdmen of Lot, and now it's spread to become this very personal conflict between Abraham and Lot. That's exactly how it's described in Hebrews 12, 15, where it says, looking diligently, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many de be defiled. Bitterness, strife, bitterness, it's called root. And it's, this root is described as a root that springs up. And that springing up is described as something that will trouble you. And that spreading is described as something that will defile many. You know, that reminds me that we had a, a, a couple blocks down from us, there, there was a neighbor a few blocks down, a master gardener named Wanda. Wanda, dear lady, she was on dialysis. But she was a master gardener, Wanda was. And she, um, and you know, had the garden tours, they'd go to her house, she'd show a garden and so forth. And she, so Cheryl stopped by to see how she was one time about four years ago, and she said she gave her a little pot, only a pint-sized pot, of, and, and she said this is a beautiful morning glory pot. You know, most morning glories, you plant them, they die, you know. Not this one. This is a perennial morning glory pot that she gave to Cheryl, and it, and it looked pretty. It had a little flower on it, you know, and Cheryl brought it back, and this little tiny plastic pint-sized pot had little... Uh, uh, drains at the bottom for the water to come out when you water it so it didn't get waterlogged. 
And so Cheryl, she just thought to herself, you know, I'll plant it later, but I don't really want it to die, so I'll just take the little pot, and she put it outside our front door on the dirt where the sprinklers would water it, you know, and, she's, and it was behind a plant, so, well, actually what happened, the plant grew, and it kind of hid the pot. So the pot kind of was out of mind, you know, the little pot. And, she, and, she, and we forgot about that little plant, you know. Well, the weeks, they turned into months, <laughs> and the months, they turned into a couple of years. And those roots from that morning glory plant, they grew out of those little drains at the bottom for the, for the water. And that morning glory plant, it just became a monster. It went around this little stream, and then it went down, and we have this raised uh, deck, you know, on the front of the house, it went under the raised deck. It, w it traveled, it went along the front, it went 100 feet, this little thing did, you know. And then, you know, and, 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 and all of a sudden, when it became obvious and the flowers are blooming and so forth, it has, it's killing now India hawthorn bushes that are five feet tall. It's grown up 20 feet. It's threatening a 70-foot pine by choking it. <laughs> and it's gone on to our neighbor's property. <laughs> Many are defiled, you know. <laughs> and I mean, we had to set up, la I'm not kidding. We had to set up ladders. And it's taken literally years of a lot of work to fight this thing back. And just last week, we saw it popping up again. See? Now, why did all that happen? Because we did not look diligently at that root, and we neglected it. And that is a picture of Hebrews 12, where it speaks about the root of bitterness. That's a picture of that, that verse in, 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 in Hebrews 12, 15, because, because, it, it, because that morning glory has to be watched diligently. So now you'll all be very careful if you see a morning glory. Because it's so easy for us to become bitter. And someone says, did you know what, what he said to so-and-so? Oh, that's terrible. Well, what's the matter with him? And then you tell another person who tells another person, and the morning glory's on the run. <laughs> and finally, many are defiled. And Abraham realized that this strife between Abraham and Lot was a root of bitterness that had to be stopped. Abraham was diligent here. And that's what we're seeing here, diligence of Abraham. And last week, we saw the sterling character of Abraham just shine forth in verse 8, like we've never seen Abraham before, when he says these words, let there, he gives a principle, let there be no strife. That's the principle. And we saw Abraham in that capacity as a great peacemaker. Abraham was a peacemaker. And that's exactly as a, he was the peacemaker that the Lord Jesus Christ was referring to on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 9, when the Lord said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. So when Abraham saw what was, what, what, what was happening, he was horrified. And he says, let there be no strife. And when he did that, God looked at Abraham and he saw him uh, making peace. And he said, blessed is Abraham, the peacemaker. He'll be called the children of God. And why are the peacemakers called the children of God? Because as children, they follow what God does, what the God the Father does. God makes peace. The children make peace. And that was the purpose. If you wanted to say, what is the purpose? What is the one purpose for why the Lord Jesus Christ came to earth? It was to make peace. It was to make peace. That's what it means when it says in Colossians 1.20, and having made peace, through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. So the concept here is peace through reconciliation. That's what Abraham's trying to do, to reconcile Abraham and Lot together, make peace. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ did. He reconciled to make peace. Our problem is, Sin destroys our peace. It says in Isaiah 57, 20 through 21, the wicked 
are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest. It doesn't have the ability to rest. It cannot rest. Whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. We had no peace. We had no peace with other people. We had no peace within ourselves. And we had no peace with God. But the Lord Jesus Christ solved the problem. That's what he did. By making us first to have peace with God. Like it says in Romans 5.1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So when he brought us peace with God, then he brought us peace within ourselves, as it says in 1 John 3.20, for if our heart condemn us, in other words, if our heart says no peace because I'm condemning you, then it says God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Now, when he brought us peace with God, he also brought us peace with others as well as it says in Proverbs 16, 7, when a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. So how did the Lord Jesus Christ make or bring us peace with God? Well, as it says, having made peace through the blood of his cross. It was through the blood of his cross, the blood of his cross that was shed on that little mountain in Jerusalem called Calvary. And there he made, there's where he made our peace with God. You might want to turn to Psalm 85, verse 9 through 10. Because in Psalm 89, verse, Psalm 85, verse 9, it speaks about what happened at Calvary. What happened at that Mount Calvary in there in Jerusalem that brought this peace. Here's what it says, Psalm 85, 9 through 10. Surely his salvation is nigh, nigh them that fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. So when it speaks in this verse about his salvation, that's speaking about God's salvation. In the Hebrew, the Hebrew, as you know, the Hebrew word Yeshua means Jesus, and this Hebrew word, uh, and Yeshua has within it the word salvation, which is appearing here. So God brought his salvation, or his, his Jesus, near. And he brought, it to, he brought it to that glory might dwell in the land, the land of Israel. And so from this verse here, we see that, that we can picture, we picture, there's a wonderful scene here. It's like drama. It's like uh, theatrics or something like that. Anyway, we have in here two persons. We have over here Mr. Mercy, or, or, or Mrs. Mercy, and then we have over here Mr. Truth. See? And Mr. Truth says, man has sinned, and that's the truth, and he is deserving of hell, and that's the truth. And then we have Mrs. Mercy, and Mrs. Mercy, she's stretching out her hands, and she say, but man needs mercy to not be cast into hell for his sins. See? And then we have another two persons there. And so the, those two persons, first of all, you know, mercy and truth, they're not reconciled. They're at odds with each other, no agreement. But we have so mercy extending her hands. She's pleading for the mercy of man. Truth is saying, I won't hear it. He says, until the demands of truth, which that man has sinned and he deserves to die, he deserves to be cast into hell, until that's been satisfied, I won't hear it. So truth looks at mercy and turns his back and, and says to mercy, no mercy until truth is satisfied. And then we have two other persons who are standing there at Calvary. And the one person there is, is Mr. Righteousness. And Mr. Righteousness is saying, man is not righteous. Man is not right. He doesn't think right. He doesn't say right things. He doesn't do right things. He's just not right. And payment must be made for his unrighteousness. Judgment must fall for man's unrighteousness. So, <clears throat> 
And so he says, he, 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 he turns to, to Mrs. Mercy, and, 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 and he says, I won't hear of your mercy until the truth is satisfied, and the truth is, is that man has sinned. And, 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 and so we have this tremendous conflict going on. And of course, like I said, there's Mrs. Peace, and she's also stretching out her arms to Mr. Righteousness. And Mrs. Peace is saying, but man needs peace. Please allow him to have peace with God. And, and Mr. Righteousness turns back to Mrs. Peace and says, I won't hear of it. I won't hear of your peace. No peace until the demands of righteousness are met. So there's no reconciliation between these two people, between, between Mrs. Peace and Mr. Righteousness. So on the one side, we have you know, Mrs. Mercy and Mrs. Peace, and they're pleading over the other side to Mr. Truth and Mr. Righteousness, and they're standing there, and there's no reconciliation until the judgment demands of truth and the payment demands of righteousness have been met. And then all of a sudden, it happens that between these, these two, two, between them, between them, Roman soldiers come, and they drive nails into the hands and into the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when they do, blood spurts out, out of the hands, out of his feet. It's the blood of his cross, as referred to in Colossians. And those Roman soldiers now have now lifted up that cross in the air, and then they drop it in the hole with such a mighty jolt that all his bones become out of joint. And now, from the cross, his blood continues to flow. It's the blood of his cross. And the blood of his cross is now making peace. It's reconciling from Colossians 1.20. Having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. And suddenly, the person named Truth turns and, and, and he sees the blood and he sees that it's the, the demands have been met demands for peace, and suddenly the person named Righteousness, he sees that the demands of judgment are being made for man, and seeing the blood, the person named Truth turns to the person named Mercy, and they're reconciled. They meet. They meet. They have a friendly meeting there. Very unusual thing in Israel, but they have a friendly meeting. <laughs> and then seeing the blood, the person named Righteousness turns to the person named Peace, and they kiss each other. That's a kiss that was felt all over the universe. And that reconciliation between mercy and truth and peace and righteousness all happen because of the blood of the cross, the blood of his cross, the blood of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the, for the first time ever, now there is a great reason to do what he asked for from the cross. What did he ask for from the cross? He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they were forgiven when he said, Father, forgive them. And if the Father said to the Lord Jesus, why? Why should I forgive them? Give them a reason. The Lord Jesus would reply, it's my sinless body that's being broken for them. It's my sinless blood that's being shed for them right now. Because it's my sinless soul that's being poured out unto death for them right now. And therefore, he could say, Father, forgive them. And the Father forgave because he saw the blood. He saw the blood. You might like to turn. Because this is really all about the, the passage in Exodus. And so if you like to turn to Exodus 12, 13, or maybe you know it already. But anyway, Exodus 12, 13. It says, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And so that was the first part, see? The, the people in the houses, they looked at the blood. And God said, that's a sign for you. But then, he says, now for me, this is not in the scripture, but I'm just telling you this. But then he says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. So not until he saw the blood did he pass over. But when he saw the blood, he passed over. And that was the blood of reconciliation that made peace. Peace with God. On, see, the cross was all about Exodus 12, 13. The cross was all about when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. We can just picture the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross speaking right from Exodus 12, 13, with his blood flowing from him, and he's saying to God, Here, Father, do you see the blood? 
Do you see the blood? Here's the blood you've been waiting for. It's the blood that's flowing from me. It's my blood, Father. It's my blood flowing for sinners to spare them from judgment. It's in plain sight now, Father. Do you see the blood? And, and he said, because, and then he, he, he would have said, Father, you said, when I see the blood, I will pass over sinners. Here's the blood, Father. Here it is. And the Father would say, yes, my son. Yes, I see the blood. I see your blood. I see your blood flowing for lost sinners so that they can be spared from hell. They can be spared from judgment. Yes, seeing the blood, I can now spare them from judgment. I can now pass over them, and I do now pass over every lost sinner that puts himself under the protection of your blood. I see the protecting, God would say, the Father would say, I see the protecting umbrella of your blood and I spare every hell-deserving sinner, which is all of us, who runs under the umbrella of your blood. And then from the cross, with his blood flowing, he then says, Father, forgive them. And he was really saying, Father, pass over them. Father, from Exodus 12, you see the blood, pass over them. <clears throat> and if God passes over, Sinners who flee for shelter under the blood, he's, he's sparing them from being cast into hell. Why? Because the Lord Jesus has made peace through the blood of his cross, and man and God are reconciled. They come together. Man has peace with God. So what we see on the cross is God made flesh to die for man. What we see on the cross is a, the work of God as the great peacemaker. And so what we see here, that's why peacemakers see they're called the children of God. And so Abraham, when he says, let there be no strife, Abraham's the great peacemaker. Now, <clears throat> he says in verse 8, he says in verse 8, he's really stretching now, Abraham. And he, make, he wants this reconciliation with all of his heart, with Lot. So he says, I pray thee, I pray thee, I beg thee, I beseech thee. And the words, you know, they're words of affection. We have to look at Abraham. This is a words of affection. He's reaching, he's reaching, he's stretching, Abraham is. He wants to make peace with a Lot in, in a very affectionate way. And it shows how Abraham, he kept his cool. There's something about land disputes in Israel that always brings up hot tempers, you know. But anyway, and, and he says, I pray thee. And so we can see him, Abraham reaching deep down inside him to make peace. You know, we talked about this last week. Romans 12, 18. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. See, the, in the Greek, the you is, is, the, is, the, is emphatic. So the emphasis on this verse is on the word you. So as much as lieth in you, is the way you might say it, live peaceably with all men. It's all about what's lying in you, not in the other person, but in you. You know, the verse does not say, as much as lieth in others, live peaceably with all men. You know, well, I forgive him when, he's, when, he, when he comes around and says he's sorry. Not until then. Eh? No. <clears throat> Waiting for him to say he's sorry is looking for something that's lying in him. And it's looking for repentance to lie in him. But the verse says, as much as lieth in you, where the emphasis is on you, has nothing to do with the other person. So Abraham knew that if there was going to be peace between him and Lot, then it was going to have to be all about what was lying inside Abraham. So Abraham digs deep and he finds some affection down there for Lot. And he uses these words, I pray thee, I pray thee. And we can just imagine how Abraham and Lot, and they met, and, and you know, in this meeting, it was a powder keg. It was a powder keg waiting for a spark to explode and be much worse. But Abraham, he saw that, he saw wrath, and he says, I gotta turn away this wrath. How am I gonna turn away this wrath? And he's got it, Proverbs 15, 1. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up, stir, stir up anger. See, grievous words, they're either the match or the gasoline, either one. But <clears throat> So we see in Abraham a man who is willing to condescend when he begged his inferior, Lot, with the words, I beg thee, I pray thee. 
And it's very interesting to see Abraham condescend here to Lot. And Abraham's condescension brings out this, that he's really focused on verse 7. See, look at verse 7. It says in verse 7 that the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelt in the land. So now notice right after it says that statement, the Canaanite and the Perizzite built in the land, dwelt in the land there, that it says right after that, Abraham says he, he's trying to make peace. Let there be no strife. It's as if Abraham has his eye on the Canaanite and the Perizzite, the end of verse 7, when he says to Lot, let there be no strife, I pray thee. It's as if Abraham is saying to Lot, Lot, let the Canaanites and the Perizzites fight it out. Let the Canaanites and the Perizzites argue, but not us. Not us. And Abraham was ex obeying exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ said to do in Mark 10, 42-35. When, when Jesus called, to, called them to him and saith unto them, You know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles, <clears throat> the Canaanites and the Perizzites are Gentiles, exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever shall be the chiefest shall be the servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So Abraham was saying to Lot, it's the Canaanites and the Perizzites, those Gentiles, whose rulers exercise lordship over their subordinates. But right from the words of Mark 10, 43, Abraham was saying, but so shall it not be among us. And we see Abraham really being great here as he gave place and ministered to Lot. I did minister to Lot. He's appealing to him. He's trying to find a chord with him, and we're going to see that. And so Abraham, being the chiefest, now he now becomes the servant to Lot. And the way I see that later, Lot, you choose whatever land you like, I'll take the other one. And so in what Abraham, and this was not easy for Abraham, and what Abraham did in this chapter, we see Abraham being just like the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, <clears throat> verse 8. So with an eye on the Canaanite and the Perizzite, Abraham was in essence saying to Lot, Lot, let the Canaanite and the Perizzite spend their lives arguing and fighting. Remember I told you last week about my cousin and my uncle who for 20 years have been not speaking to each other because of Wedgwood, China. Anyway, <clears throat> nothing wrong with Wedgwood, China, but anyway. And and he says, and so he's saying, let the Canaanite, let the Perizzite waste their time on earth in these bitter feuds. Let the Canaanite and the Perizzite spend their limited amount of energy on getting even. Let the Canaanite, let the Perizzite exhaust themselves in planning out their next revenge. But not us. Not us, Lot. We are not Canaanite and we are not parasites. We are not Gentiles. We are believers. And so, and, and, it's a, and Lot, as believers, we are strangers. We are pilgrims on this earth. So by saying that, Lot, Abraham was saying to Lot the words of Hebrews eleven thirteen, 13. It says, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. So, in essence, Lot was, uh, Abraham was saying to Lot, Lot, we want to die in faith. And this is a teacher now to, to Lot. But not, we want to die in faith, not having received the promises, but we want to see them afar off. And Lot, this strife is going to blind our vision to these promises. Lot, we want to be persuaded by these promises. We want to embrace these promises so that we can freely confess we're strangers, we're pilgrims on the earth, not like the Canaanites and Perizzites. Lot, this strife is going to cause us to abandon those promises and lose our confession. See? So by affectionately saying to Lot, let there be no strife, I pray thee, Abraham is saying the words of 1 Peter 2.11, dearly beloved, uh, 
I pray thee. Dearly beloved, I beseech thee, as strangers and pilgrims, abstain, hold back, refrain, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. So Abraham is saying to Lot, Dearly beloved Lot, I beseech you as a stranger and pilgrim, we must abstain from this fleshly lust to want to get even and to want to set the record straight. Lot, my strife with you is not a strife against you. It's a war against my own soul. Let there be no strife. Lot, your strife with me is not a strife against me. It's a war against your own soul. Let there be no strife. So by seeing the Canaanite and the Perizzite at the end of verse 7, and then by say, Abraham saying to Lot at the start of verse 8, let there be no strife, Abraham was saying to Lot the words of Hebrews eleven sixteen. 16. But now they desire a better country. That is in heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. So Abraham is saying to Lot, Lot, look at the Canaanite, look at the Perizzite. They don't desire a better country, a heavenly. Wherefore, God would be ashamed to be called their God, and God has not prepared for them a city. And, and so, <clears throat> and they strive with each other, Lot, Lot, unlike them, we do desire a better country, a heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called our God, and he has prepared for us a city. Therefore, let there be no strife. By seeing the Canaanite and the Perizzite at the end of verse 7, and then Abraham saying to Lot at the start of verse 8, let there be no strife, Abraham was in essence saying to Lot the words from the Lord Jesus Christ in John 8, 29. And he, he that sent me is with me, the Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. So he would say, Abraham would say, Lot, look at those Canaanites and those Perizzites. They don't have any desire at all to please God. Lot, we're different from the Canaanite and the Perizzite. Our lives are focused on always doing those things that please God. Lot, it displeases God when we fight, so let there be no strife. And Abraham was in essence saying to Lot the words of Paul from 2 Timothy 2.4, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. So Abraham is saying to Lot, Lot, look at those Canaanites and Perizzites. They do not see themselves as soldiers of God. But not us, Lot. We are soldiers of God. And we want to please him who chose us to be soldiers. Lot, we desert our posts as soldiers of God when we entangle ourselves with this fight. So therefore, Lot, we don't want to entangle ourselves with this strife. So Lot, let there be no strife. And Abraham was in, in essence saying the words of Hebrews eleven sixteen: Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that is a reward that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So Abraham is saying to Lot, Lot. Look again at those Canaanites and those Perizzites. They, they, they don't want to please God. That's not in their interest. That's not on their radar screen. They have no use for faith to believe that God is. They're not interested in any award that, reward that God may give for diligently seeking him. But not us, Lot. We want to please God. We want to come to God so we believe that he is. We want God to reward us. So, so we diligently seek him. We, Lot, we become practical atheists when we fight. So let there be no strife. Now, <clears throat> he goes on, verse 8. Now, in the Hebrew, there is a very important statement after the word for and before the words we be brethren. So our English says for we be brethren. <clears throat> and, uh, but there's an important statement before that. I could find no translation that did not omit this. The King James omits it, the New King James, the NIV, the, N the NSAB, Luther omits it, Calvin omits it, Segon, 
uh, the American Standard of Revival, you name it, every single, the Jewish publication service, they all omit it. Every translation I looked at in English and German and Spanish and Italian and French, all of them omitted this very important statement. You want to know why they omitted it? I'll tell you. I don't know. <laughs> but it's an important statement. <laughs> Because it's, it reads this, it says, it's, the, the Hebrew reads, Ki anashim achim anachnu. So literally, ki is the, uh, for or that. And then what they omitted was the word, the statement anashim, and they said achim anachnu, which is we be brethren. So they, they put in there, we be brethren. But, that's, but there's more of something very important that Abraham said. Because he said, ki anashim, for we be men. Ish is a man, Yashim. For we be an Ashim, we be men. So what Abraham was saying here is that we be men. Before he gets to the we be brethren, we be men. And when he was saying that to, to Lot again, you know, Abraham's reaching deep down in inside him and he says, Look, Lot, we be men, not brute beasts. We be men, not savages. We be men, not rational. Uh, uh, sorry, we are rational creatures. We be men. We can have a gentleman agreement, a gentleman's agreement. We be men. Let's work this out and, 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 and not fight it out. Let's work it out and not fight it out. We are civil. Right? <clears throat> now, again, you know, Abraham is reaching way, way deep down here within him to appeal to Lot's sense of civility. I mean, Lot, you've got to really appreciate Abraham here. I mean, Abraham, and he comes along and he says, Lot, principle of it all, let there be no strife. And then he says, uh, <clears throat> he, says he says, let there be no strife. Then he says, I pray thee for, for principle's sake, let's not fight. For, I pray thee for affection's sake, let's not fight. We be men for civility's sake, for re rational, rationality's sake, let's not fight. And then he says, we be brethren for family's sake. Let's not fight. What does it take for you, Lot, that we can resonate, reson, resonate together on this theme of let's not fight. Let we be brethren. So now, he comes to the last argument in verse 8, and he does say, Achim Anachnu, he says, we be brethren. So again, he says, so we can imagine Abraham now, with tears in his face, looking into the eye of Lot, all these arguments for why, and he says, we be brethren. We be brethren by saying that Abraham was not just saying, we're not just physically related. There are many physical relations, relatives to Abraham that were very far from God. I and mean, Lot had followed Abraham in coming to Jehovah Jesus. And that made Lot Abraham's double brother to him. The lesser important was the fact that Lot was Abraham's physical brother, physical relative of far greater importance was the fact that Lot was Abraham's spiritual relative because both Abraham and Lot had received Jehovah Jesus and having done that, both of them were given power to become the sons of God. They both had become born uh, again not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And that made them really brethren, double brethren. I remember when I was in Ethiopia, and I met this, evan and the evangelistic team was going, coming through, and we had lunch together. And one of the ladies in the team came up to me and said she was from the north in the city of Gondar, and she said she was a believing Jew, Jewish, Jewess, you know, Jew. And I just looked at her, I just... <laughs> I mean, that jet black skin. I just looked at it, and she saw me looking at her, and she looks at me and she, as if to say, well, what of it? And I didn't know what to say, so I just said, I didn't know I had a black sister. <laughs> anyway, but she was. She was a double sister. Why? First, she was Jewish through Moses. You remember, Moses married the Ethiopian, and so she was a descendant. But more importantly, she was a spiritual sister in the Lord Jesus Christ. So Lot says, the double emphasis, we be brethren, physically and spiritually. And the Lord Jesus Christ explained who the spiritual brethren were when he said in Luke 8, 21, he answered and said unto them, My mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. And that's the way we should see followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, is our brothers 
And whenever we, and so there, when someone comes up to us and says, hi, brother, that, that's not necessary. Most of, many times that's code for I can't remember your name. <laughs> but, but by saying we be brethren, Abraham was saying to Lot, consider Lot as brethren in the Lord, in, in the Lord how much we share together. We have the same enemies, we have the same goals, we have the same God, we have the same passions. We, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's all encompassed in the word, we be brethren. So let's work this out, if for no other reason, because we are brethren. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for these, uh, <clears throat> this example that Abraham has been to us this morning. We pray, Lord, that we wouldn't just study about it, but that we would, we, we would be like him. We would follow him in his great desire to have no strife. Lord, we pray. Teach us these things and help us to obey. In Jesus' name, amen.